Tonight, we have a really special guest, and we're really very happy to have this uh, person join us tonight. He is a former gymnast. He's a coach. He has a doctorate in physical therapy, and he's a board-certified sports physical therapist. I mean, there couldn't be anybody more perfect for us to try to help us understand safety in our sport. And his particular interest is that he's interested in and has been doing research in and clinical work in the prevention of injuries as well as the rehabilitation of injuries. So why is Dave joining us? We're doing practice judging. He's probably not looking too much forward to doing practice judging, but he is interested. I'm not the man to help you with that at all. <laughs> uh, okay. So I wanted to give just a little context for his participation tonight. One of the benefits of being uh, the president of our association is that Lois and I get to meet with representatives from the Women's Collegiate Gymnastics Association, the Coaches Association. And we specifically work with Jackie Thane and Jessica Santos. They're the co-chairs of the Judges Assigning Committee. So after the Coaches Convention last year, one of the things that we, everybody I think agreed would be helpful is if we could find ways for judges and coaches to communicate more with each other so that we have the same common understanding and perspective. In this case, we're talking about safety and particularly safety in landings. One of the things that coaches have been concerned about and express quite clearly is that they're concerned about what they perceive as inconsistency from one team to another, from one conference to another, and from one division to another. And of course, what they want, as do we, we want an athlete who has the same performance to get the same score, regardless of who's judging, regardless of what conference she's in, regardless of what division she's competing in. We try to think of how can we go about promoting consistency. We picked two areas to focus on this year. One is the area of landings. And we thought that landings would be something that's very visible. We know it's very visible. The spectators see it. The coaches see it. Of course, we see it. And so do the TV commentators. And they all like to make a big deal out of landing. And so we think, you know, this is something where we thought we could try to standardize our expectations for landing deductions so that those can become more consistent across all the areas I mentioned, divisions, conferences, teams, et cetera. The other area is balance errors, and the balance errors on balance beam. Those are quite visible as well. We know that things like amplitude and execution are really important too. But when you, those are things that the audience sees that the commentators see on television and comment about, and the things that coaches tend to get most upset about are either the deductions that they believe are taken or not taken on landings, or taken or not taken on balance errors. So we developed a series of activities with coaches. We've been working on it from all summer long, actually. And we're going to introduce you to that project later on tonight. Uh, but the one that we want to focus on right now, and the reason Dave is here, is because we're interested in landings, particularly safe landings. So how did that come about as a result of the project we've been working on? The way it came about is one of the coaches told us that their gymnast lost deductions for landing in what was considered to be the exemplary position for safety. And it was simply because the judge had not learned the positions that we considered to be acceptable in landing and we're kind of going on probably some historical views of landing in which we tended to see, think of Jim as landing on a straight up and down. So we thought, well, this is something that we can actually work on. And we were working on that. And then I said, you know, I need, really need somebody who's got a scientific base in this, because certainly I don't have that. And Jackie Fain was going to work one day and she was listening to a podcast that Dave was doing. And she contacted me right away and said, we need him <laughs> to come and to do our session. So she and I Zoomed with him and he graciously agreed to join us tonight. So what we hope to learn tonight would be what are the positions for landing that are considered safe and unsafe? And how does that relate to our deductions? We're not doing anything to try to change those deductions. We just want to make sure we apply them appropriately and don't deduct for safe landings. If, as a result of all the discussions we have about landings, we think that some of the deductions may need to be changed, uh, we can certainly work with the Women's Technical Committee 
for the USA GH group program, and we can work with the collegiate coaches for the college program to adapt those deductions. But just in kind of looking at them and listening to Dave, I think the deductions are okay that we just need to sharpen up a little bit how we apply those to make sure we're taking into account safe landings. So with that, Dave, thank you so much for joining us and we'll turn it over to you and uh, we're going to disappear. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me, everyone. Uh, I'm obviously not a judge, right? I am a, uh, like, like Catherine said, a, a coach and I was a gymnast and uh, a lot of other things, but not a judge. So I just want to kind of first say thank you. It's very flattering to be able to talk to everybody here about something that's really important and it's really near and dear to my heart. As you guys heard, I'm a sports physical therapist and the champion clinic that I work at in Boston is called champion. Uh, we see, I see about 70% gymnasts from compulsory all the way to the international elite and the national teams and stuff like that. And so this is something that I see the downstream effects of, whether it's in terms of injuries or in terms of rehab, but I also obviously being a gymnast and someone who's a huge fan of the sport and NCAA gymnastics in particular, because a lot of the girls that I coach look up to obviously college and I work with a lot of the college teams consulting. It's something that I feel like if we have something that's really clear is, is modifiable to reduce the risk of, of really big injuries, as I'll talk about. And it's something that could really easily be fixed if we all just kind of learn a little bit about the science. It, it's really um, something that can make a, like a massive impact on the quality of life, but also the performance of a lot of athletes. And so that's kind of what I hope to approach from this is summarize my coaching and my being a gymnast and all the scientific geeky stuff that I do and really present to you what I think the science says about safe landings. And I chose videos that intentionally didn't have deductions, but maybe aren't ideal from a safety point of view. But I also took some videos from, um, as you'll see, Kyla Ross, who had got 10.0s on vault and she had really good landing mechanics and she also got a 10.0. The hope here is that we can just kind of maybe share some information and then from there, show some videos, have some discussion. I'll take as many questions as we want or after the fact just keep in mind that all of this comes from a position of like love and empathy right like i'm not trying to be negative or at all i'm just trying to point out maybe what the last 10 years of science has showed us from my mentors who are kind of world renowned in the knee and the ankle like uh, rehab world but also like what strength conditioning literature and what a lot of things tells us so with that said um we'll kind of get started here and i guess the first thing to think about if you look at the research this textbook was something i was really fortunate to be a part of and emily sweeney helped me write it uh, with many other authors leg injuries in general are up to about 70 percent of all gymnastics injuries based on what you look at college or elite or um, club compulsory um, and in a study looking at 2009 and 2014, 50 percent of all the injuries that happened across all the NCAA in those five years were leg. Right. And the knee and the ankle is the most common. And then if you look at some studies, about half the injuries that are occurring in gymnastics are, are having something to do with landings. Right. And so Ellen Casey, who is the national team physician for the women's team, and I are really good friends. We run a lot of research together actively in the NCAA right now. And she wrote this really impactful thing in the book. She says that landings are considered the riskiest exercise phase in all of gymnastics. Right. So of all the things we do it's the landing itself that's probably the most high risk and that's probably contribute to injuries. So the biggest injuries when you look at the uh, gymnastics, right? So like I said, the knee and the ankle, the knee joint itself has the highest rate of severe injuries, right? So these are injuries that are really big, are really unfortunate, are really scary, and they have the highest rates of surgery, but also the most times missed, right? So things like ACL tears, meniscus tears, stress fractures, right? Those are things that come from really high force landings in particular. So with that being said, we understand like, okay, this is a really big problem and athletes oftentimes miss up to a year of, of practice because of this. It's clearly something we want to try to make a dent in right so after that the ankle joint is the most commonly injured across all of gymnastics right so ankle sprains ankle fractures foot fractures cartilage issues that's the most commonly injured joint in all across gymnastics right and then i think we all know whether you're a former gymnast or not that there is a huge rate of overuse injuries in like the lower back the knee and the ankle right they all have really really big high rates of just overuse kind of chronic achy stuff whether it's younger with severs disease or older with patellar tendonitis all these issues right I think for me, the, the emotional catalyst of this is that we all know that these can be devastating for athletes, right? They can be devastating in terms of what they do for losing a season, but they stay with them for the rest of their life. There's a lot of athletes who struggle with knee pain or struggle with repeat injuries or can't quite get back to their highest level of performance after some of these really big injuries, whether you're talking about an ACL tear or an Achilles tear, which is another huge project that Ellen and I did last year in the NCAA. We know they have really big consequences, so we want to try to do anything we possibly can to mitigate the risk. Okay, and the biggest factor these all have in common are landings. There's so many factors that go into why somebody gets an ACL tear or why somebody has a stress fracture. I'm not saying it's just landings, but a common denominator that's really obvious that from the research point of view and also just you know intuitively from being a fan of the sport is that landings can affect all of these things the knee the ankle the overuse stuff the back right and if you look at the forces of gymnastics 
the highest recorded forces we know are, are during landings, right? So they're anywhere between five to 18 times body weight, just like regular stuff. So that was a double back on floor on a force plate um, in a condition that they measured in the lab. The highest recorded forces anywhere are at the ankle joint, which is 23 times uh, body weight during landing and tumbling, right? And so there's a lot of, it's hard to conceptualize what just body weight forces are, but imagine like the comparison that some people use, like imagine jumping out of a second story building and having to land safely, right? Clearly you'd want to land in a way that maximally made you as safe as possible. And what we'll talk about with ideal landings is we're trying to use as many muscle groups and as many joints as possible to make sure we're doing that. OK, so taking a big step back and not even looking at judging a competition, what is taught to a young athlete and is used throughout their career is, is what's going to happen over and over again. So if we say we're going to do a you're trying to go full on vault. Obviously, they have to land thousands of times per month between floor and vault and bar dismounts and beam dismounts. And so if we can change the way that we're maybe encouraging people to land from a safety point of view, if we can even knock off 10 percent of the stress on the knee and the ankle joints, that times a thousand per month is, is massive. Like the impact of that is hard to even conceptualize because of how much better it could be. So that's kind of just framing up why it's important. Okay, if you look at the research, and there's a lot of really good research on ACL, knee injuries, Achilles injuries, lower back problems. That, uh, fortunately, my mentors here in Boston have written a lot of this research from Alabama and many other places. There's two really big modifiable factors that we can change, right? There's many things we can't change, but of the two things we can change, one is going to be using proper jumping and landing techniques. This has pretty much been established really well in ACL research, the meniscus research, and many other joint kind of cartilage issues as well. The other thing, which I'll talk to the coaches about more next Next week is going to be strength and physical preparation, right? Like I think that's something that obviously judging is not going to be influencing, but um, understanding that the fact that judges and the code itself is massively important for number one is really the takeaway of this presentation. Okay. We want to make sure, as Catherine said, that the gymnasts aren't getting deducted if they're landing in what's considered the safest ways possible. And I'll, I'll hopefully share, uh, share what those are with some videos and some, uh, some different breakdowns. Okay. The rest of this research, I, I'm the one who loves being a geek. I don't mind being a nerd. I read like 30 studies last week to revisit these concepts and make sure they were legit. These studies and many, many other in the references section, if you do want to learn more about it, there's plenty of information there, but I'm not going to bore anybody with that because that's not really what you're here for. Um, so what do we want to look for? Okay. So from the side, okay, again, this is from a safety point of view to maximally protect the, the athlete and make sure they can, they can hopefully stick properly from the side. When you look at someone, you want to see that when they're landing, the hip angle is relatively open when they hit the ground. Well, the reason that is because if the hip joint is open, they can bend and absorb forces, right? When joints bend and you're using proper technique, things like the glutes, the hamstrings, the quads, they can help slow down some of those forces and, and dissipate those forces, right? So if we land with a hip angle that's open, right, it allows you to kind of land. I think that's kind of where people understand that, right, from being able to complete a flip and not land short, right, or kind of land under rotated. That's the reason why is because if you don't have that hip angle to bend, there's really no way to help absorb the forces, okay? This is a huge one. The, one of the biggest things we know from ACL research is that landing with a 30 degree angle in the knee is, is massively important. The reason that is, is because it allows the back and the front of the leg muscles to work equally. Okay. So the hamstrings and the quads work equally when you land at a 30 degree knee bend. What happens oftentimes as we'll see in a video is when you land very upright and the knees don't hit that 30 degree angle, it's what we call a quad dominant landing in, in rehab, right? And what that means is it's a lot of stress on the front of the knee, but it's very, very high chance for the, for the knee joint to kind of cave and pivot. And that's how an ACL tear occurs or a meniscus tear or someone hyperextends their knee or something like that. So it's very important that when they are hitting the ground, we want to train and use and see that 30 degree landing right angle starting at, at, at a beginning point. So from there, right, when you look at that, what's the next three things? And these are probably two and three are probably the most important from a side view. OK, number three is that the hip and the knee angles continue to bend until they reach a squat just above parallel. OK, so I don't believe in going really, really far past parallel because we know that's not optimal for the knee joint. But starting at 30 degrees and bending about 40 or 50 more degrees until you get to a squat to parallel is the best possible chance of using everything you have to slow down those forces. OK, so what happens when you squat? To parallel is your glutes, your hamstrings, your quads, your calves. They are all very, very active uh, to absorb those forces, right? So if you have an athlete that's very, very strong, they do all their physical preparation and they're, they're doing everything they can to get strong in the gym, but then they don't land in a way that allows the squat to go down to parallel. They're not using the strength they have to protect themselves. And what it puts a high amount of force on is the knee joints, right? So it's a lot of potential buckling of the knee or of the ankle joint. And then also the back can be jarred to as well. So we want to see somebody squat to parallel depth or just above, right? So about 80 degrees of parallel or so. Okay. And then when you look at someone from the side, 
we draw imaginary lines down their torso angle and down their shin angle. And what we'd like to see if you watch somebody do a really proper squat that, you know, again, has good form and isn't stressing one area too much, you see relatively parallel lines between their torso and their shin. So as they land, you want that to be more open of a hip angle, but then they want to find themselves in a slightly forward chest angle. And as they're squatting to depth, you want to see those lines be relatively parallel. And again, that's not really more from like research proves that that's the way to do it. But what we know is that when you squat in that way, we know that the muscle activity is really, really high in the back of the leg, the glutes, the hamstrings, the outer hips. That's just the way to get a, a nice proper squat that again, shares the load across all the joints. So those are the four big things that we're looking for when we're seeing somebody, are they squatting in a way that's maximally protecting them against the forces that they have coming their way? And I think a really good example of this is Kyla um, from a couple of years ago, 2019, maybe. And I intentionally chose videos of Kyla that were 10.0s because she didn't get deducted, but they were also very, very safe. We'll show this first. And then I have some breakdowns of the slides to show exactly kind of why, you know, it matches what we just talked about. You should be able to see it play. And I'll, I'll play it a couple of times. And hopefully you guys can see similar things of what I just talked about in the, in the beginning of the lecture. Just one more time here. Okay, so just look for squat depth, look for the way her chest angle is, right? And you see how she does have a really nice descent into the squat. So again, the reason we're trying to do that is because we wanna see, can we absorb those forces maximally, right? So when you look at her from the side, and I know it's a one and a half versus I'll show you like a half and half out laid out or something like that. Clearly we're gonna have more of an open hip angle with a blind landing versus if you're under rotating on bars or something like that, it'll be a little bit less. But Kyla does actually have a video that I saw on YouTube of her sticking a, a double layout and getting a 10 on bars as well. And you can see her show this pretty well. So the hip angle is relatively open at initial impact, right? And then she has that 30 degrees of knee bend. She's, she's, she's separating her legs and slightly bending her knees before impact to get ready for the landings versus trying to really have perfect form and having pin straight legs and as she hits the ground, that's obviously going to be something that's a little bit higher risk. And you'll see this in the next slide as I broke it down, right? So as you look at the green angles, right? So that's going to be the hip and the knee bending through parallel. She has this open angle. And then you can see here as she goes farther and farther, the hip angle closes, the knee angle closes down to just above uh, parallel, right? So this is what I would consider not something that's too, too far depth. Any more past this, I would say is. But she has a, almost a textbook shock absorption lantern. And this is why her and also Maggie Nichols is a really good example of some of hers. They were sticking vaults and beam routines left and right because I think either they got taught or they just naturally learned. I don't know. But this way of landing is how you have the best chance of sticking because, again, you're using all the muscles you can to absorb the forces. If someone is not doing this, they're not bending their knees, they oftentimes lose balance and take a step or fall because there's no way for the force to go and they have to take a big step forward to recover. So you can see this from the end, right, is the angles close, but then relatively speaking, right, because it's a one and a half and, and nobody is perfect, those parallel blue lines are relatively parallel the entire time, right? They don't intersect right away, which would be the chest is very far forward and the knees aren't bending, which would intersect those lines. And so that's what I look at when I watch people in the clinic, when we're rehabbing them or we're doing stuff with them or just doing strength and conditioning. A lot of gymnasts come to our facility and work out college gymnasts in the summer. And we're trying to teach them these proper mechanics when they're in the summer because it's how you get stronger, but it's what we want to see transfer over to some of their landings down the road. So now moving forward, what's not ideal, right? What do we, uh, it's going to be the opposite of a lot of those things, right? So one is going to be the hip angle is more closed when they hit the ground, because again, we have less uh, glute uh, engagement and muscle to help. If we don't have that hip angle open, it's hard to absorb those forces with a bend. The knee angle is not bent to 30 degrees. It's under 30 degrees. Okay. That's the, that's the highest risk position for ACL. That's where a lot of ACLs tears happen is, is under 30 degrees because the hamstring is not really involved. The glutes not involved and the quads are taking a lot of stress. We don't see the hip and knee angles bend to squat to parallel because, again, all those muscles can't help to, to absorb the force. It's really a lot on the quad. And then the chest angle being very, very straight upright or very, very pitched forward to parallel, right? Parallel is clearly going to be something that's a deduction. That's going to be a lot of stress in the lower back. But having someone's very, very upright torso means the knees have to bend a lot more to take that stress, but the hip is not helping out. It's all knee in the landings, right? So you don't have those parallel lines. So um, we'll show an example of this. And again, this is an example that um, did not have any deductions from a judging point of view. And again, it's not meant to be mean or say something's wrong. It's just to try to just share awareness. There's nothing in this lecture slide in, in any of these presentations that I didn't do wrong as a coach when I was growing up. I just did whatever I thought I was supposed to do. So hopefully you can see this a little bit um, in terms of maybe with a new frame of, of scientific, right? So, okay. Okay. Just one more time there. Okay. And again, this did not get any deductions, um, but it just, it just might not be the safest, right? It might be um, and I did not pick a girl who had a knee brace on purpose. That wasn't at all what I was trying to do. 
Dave, this is Jenna. While you're switching, we have a question. Are the landing examples the same for acro and dance? And are they also the same for backward and forward acro landing? Yeah, good question. So ideally, uh, if anyone who's doing uh, like a single leg landing, you're, you're very similar mechanics, right? If you're trying to use the exact same thing, the way we teach double leg landings and single leg landings are the same. So someone who has a switch leap or a switch side and they're landing, like I think it's different for me from a coaching point of view, if I'm teaching a beam landing to absorb force and stay on the beam, it's gonna be a more knee dominant, more torso upright. Like that's just how gymnastics technique is. Similarly, as I'll talk to the coaches about bounding on floor, like one and a half lay, right, is a very different thing that I would teach an athlete to do to absorb the forces versus when they land their front layout. So I think what I'm trying to say is the highest force uh, landings that we have, which is bar dismount, beam dismount, fall, and landing like a floor, but you can step out so it's not the same. That's really when it's the most important. I think that jumps and leaps and some of the other stuff is unfortunately just the nature of the sport being challenging. Um, and so I don't think that would be something that I would, I, as a coach, I wouldn't teach someone to land in a proper squat, hip hip width apart and proper sinking of their hips if they're doing a switch side. So hopefully that answers the question well. Um, but yeah, I, I teach jumping and landing for heavy landings, very different than I teach jumping and landing for switch leaps or that kind of stuff. But we would like to still see like some of these things show up a little bit. So this is the uh, still shot of the athlete from the side. Okay, so obviously the first thing we see is the hip angle is more flexed at landing. And again, this is someone who's flipping backwards, so I understand that. Um, but we'd still like to see somebody kind of open up their tuck and kind of get ready for the landing by having more of an open hip angle. And the biggest one in this is the example is, is that you can see she's got a very straight knee when she hits the ground, right? She's she's almost maybe like 15 degrees bent. This is a really high risk of when she tries to land of her one, either going backwards and hyperextending or two of like a pivoting action happening at the knee which is how ACL tears uh, typically occur. They can happen with hyperextension or pivoting both together, but also just a lot of meniscus stress as well. Okay, and you can see the two things that we talked about. So one is that she's she doesn't show those red lines. She really doesn't show any increase in hip and knee angle after she hits. She hits at 30 degrees with a flexed uh, torso and her hips close, but there's not a ton of movement more than that. You can see her knees very sharply kind of bounced kind of in just a straight landing, but it was very, very minimal. And that's just extremely high stress on the quads. And then obviously you can see because she doesn't have much of a knee bend or that proper squatting mechanics, you can see those parallel lines are not existing, right? She has very much intersecting lines throughout the entire uh, force. And I'm not trying to say that someone who lands like this is automatically going to get hurt. I'm just saying we're trying to talk about what is the relative risk and how can we reduce it? And this is what we know from ACL and many other research studies for the back and the hip as well. And the knee is what can we do to mitigate risk? That's the things that we're trying to look for. So it's not always that because you land like this, you're going to get hurt. It's just that we're saying that the chances are higher if something like this happens or for an overuse injury in particular. Anything from the front, the, the biggest thing we're going to look for is that when someone squats, the hip, the knee, the ankle are all in line. And this is something that obviously a lot of judges have started to become more aware of. And it's definitely something that's changing more as long as the heels click together. OK, and the reason that is, is because from a from a straight on point of view, if you land and the knees buckle in together, that's a lot of stress on the knee. That's how a lot of ACL tears occur. Okay. Also, if your feet and your knees are already close together, it's very hard to control the knees moving side to side because they're not really protected at all from, from the up, uh, up top hip muscles. So when you land in a proper uh, kind of train tracks uh, analogy is what we tell kids is the muscles on the outside of the hip are allowed to work really hard and prevent that kind of quiver or that knee buckling in. Sometimes you don't see this because it's so fast, but sometimes, unfortunately, it happens in a blink of an eye that somebody lands like this, their knees knock together, and then they land and they stick, and they stick perfectly, right? And I don't, I'm not going to share athletes that I watch, obviously, but you can see it like a, a, we call it a twitch, right? A very quick twitch in and out, and that's when a lot of these injuries can kind of happen. So we'd like to see the knees in feet hip width apart, but then they remain parallel as they squat down into that depth, okay? The other really big thing we know from ACL research is obviously when you land, you want each leg to take about 50% of the weight. So if your chest is leaning towards one side and you're more centered over one leg, you might have of the 18, you know, forces of body weight, you might have half those forces not being on equal leg. It might be 12 times your body weight on one side and six on the other. I'm just making up numbers, but a lot more on one side. And obviously that's going to be something that might overload and cause some serious injuries if somebody has an issue with that. They're, if they're off tilted and twisting in gymnastics and under rotating and two and a quarters, right? We all know a lot of this is technique and strength and many, many other things. But one thing we want to teach athletes to keep their torso so directly over the midpoint of their body when they do land, okay? And then let's look at Kyla, who has a really good front view here. And I chose this video on purpose because you can actually see she lands and then her left knee will actually start to quiver in and she's strong and she pulls it back out because she's in this position. Okay, so we'll watch this from the front. And again, she got a 10 on this as well. 
right? So I'll play it one more time. Watch her left knee in particular. I, I think because she's either been taught to land like this or she's strong or many other things. Um, but you can see that left leg start to wiggle in and she's very strong. She keeps it again. Okay. And if you watch the coverage of this video, they actually reshow this from the side and you can see her have her feet hip width apart, but also she squats to that same parallel depth. So again, I think this is why she's so good at sticking and she was having this, like she was on fire because of that. So when we break down this, we see those th same things, right? Again, no deductions were taken here. So it's a good, it's a good landing. The chest is equally over both knees as she squats. And I know the camera angles are hard for this one, and the next one, because we're not straight on, we're kind of off at 45 degrees, but the hips are relatively in line with the knees and the toes throughout the entire squat. And again, I, I picked this on purpose because you'll see this left leg kind of quiver and, and slow stills, right? So again, she has that open uh, contact. Very, very important, right? She has to separate her legs in the air at the very end in order to be prepared for some of these landing forces, right? And the same way that she slightly bends her knees, she also slightly brings her legs apart. And that's, that's necessary in order for her to land properly, okay? So as she hits initial impact from the side, you would see that 30 degree knee bend angle and that hip angle open. But as she sinks into her squat, there's not a lot of movement of here and here in her torso, right? You can see right here, that left leg starts to quiver in, but she can fire her, her outer hip muscles because she's set up for this and she can push against the floor and that knee doesn't collapse all the way in, right? Like obviously everybody's gonna have some small errors. This is all about what we're possibly trying to do again to just make it as safe as possible. But this is a really good ideal landing, right? As, as she lands and absorbs those forces, as she stands up, we have a little bit of knee coming together here, but this is a probably the best example that I could find of something that was not deducted and it was also very, very uh, safe from a, from a scientific point of view. Okay, what we don't want to see, we wouldn't want to see the, the feet being in hip width apart, because like I said, as you land, you can't stabilize the knees come together, twisting side to side. A lot of problems with skiers have that, right? They're mogling side to side and they have a lot of issues. We also don't want to see the feet really wide. We don't want to see it way outside hip width apart, because again, the, the hips can't help out and the knees are more prone to cave in, right? Which is three is we obviously don't want to see someone land and then have the knees knocked together. That's not obviously going to be something that's, that's great. That's a really, really high chance of, of hurting your ACL. Okay. And then obviously we don't want to see the chest being way over one side or way over the other. Okay. And then this is an example that I found that again, did not have deductions, but this one's hard to see from the side a little bit, but in fast motion, you can't really see what maybe I'm talking about. But when you slow it down, you can see her right knee has a very fast, rapid kind of inward dip and the left side of her body is taking more weight. Okay. Just watch her right knee in particular. Right. A little bit of a, an inward dip. It's, it's hard to see from this angle. Um, I bet if we saw it from the side, it'd be much more pronounced. But the concept here that we're talking about is that we're, we're just getting a little bit nervous that there's a lot of pressure on that on that left side in particular. But her right knee is also dipping in. Right. This is the, the maximal point of her knees were dipping together. The right leg was very, very in and her left was kind of all towards one side. So the torso is leaning towards the left. Right. And we don't really see the feet hip width apart. Ideally, she was inside her feet hip width. So it kind of had more of this kind of caving effect. OK. And then in slow motion here. Right. So she has what looks like almost, you know, good angles here. She's just a little bit too close together. But as she hits that initial force. Right. Maybe she has 30 degrees but her torso is more on the left and that right knee caves inward uh, quite a bit. And so that's gonna be, again, which is a little bit scary for someone maybe having some stress to their ACL. Okay, so this is just a summary here, a summary slide um, of what I personally would think would be phenomenal if we taught all kids from a very young age with again, high force landings like dismounts, vault landings, landing a floor pass, um, landing a beam, right? Uh, dismount, not so much the actual acro or some of the, the bounding tumbling, but we'd we don't wanna see the left side, we'd like to see the right side. We don't wanna see the chest being too upright, right? We also obviously don't wanna see it being like pitched over like 90 degrees in a low landing. We, want, we don't wanna see someone who isn't squatting to parallel because that's what we call a quad dominant landing. And then we want we wanna see the chest not towards one side, nor do we wanna see the feet and the, and the knees really far together nor the feet really, really wide apart, okay? What an ideal landing pattern here is a slight forward chest lean, right? Which is parallel with the shin angle, those blue lines, 30 degrees of initial impact, which you, you can't really see here, but then she would slight to slowly descend. After 30 degrees, she would go all the way down to a squat that is just above parallel, right, right here on this line, okay? And then from the front, what you'd like to see and teach is the chest being equal over both hips. We'd like to see the hips, the knees, and the middle of the foot all in line during that squat. We wanna maintain the knees and the feet being that hip width apart. We don't wanna see anything rolling in a little bit. So a little bit of a summary there, um, just to kind of hopefully make everything stick a little bit more. These are the biggest takeaways that I have, right? So number one, we want to try in every area of the sport, men's, women's, all disciplines, everything to teach, use and encourage the safest possible landing strategy based on what the current science tells us. 10 years ago, 
It might have been not as available, but we have a lot of really good research right now from friends of mine and many other of my mentors who have put out some really great uh, research that says not only is it safer, also it will help you reduce the risk of long term problems showing up. The second thing that we really want to uh, try to make sure we're teaching is that traditional landings with that upright torso or the knees being together or not having squat depth to some people, not all people. So some people that I've talked to judges, coaches, whatever, they say like, it looks prettier, right? It looks more aesthetically pleasing, but the science does not support that as the safest way. And so we have to, you know, just to swallow our, our, our old maybe notions of what we want to see and say, maybe we should update those for something that's safer, even if it's not the prettiest of all, you know, things that we do in gymnastics. Okay. And the third thing is, is that by adopting this more ideal science supported landing style, we're going to help reduce the risk of injury. Like like massively, like, like incredibly, it can help so, so much, but also it's going to increase the chance of their sticking, which is obviously something that everyone loves to see, you know, hitting a big routine. I was a gymnast. I competed in college. I know the feeling. So this is, this is a really good thing that not only can dramatically, hopefully reduce the amount of knee, hip, back and ankle injuries we have, but also dramatically increase the performance of the athlete. And so hopefully um, that's a helpful kind of summary of a lot of the research and the geekier stuff. But again, just my point of view and what I've seen in, in the 10 years that I've been traveling and coaching and teaching and doing consulting work around the world. Um, it, it's really, again, said with nothing but empathy and love and wanting to help everybody. None of this is said with malice or that we're doing something wrong. It's, it's purely just to figure out, you know, we used to think something and now we think something different. Maybe we should try our best to kind of update that a little bit. So that is all I have. Um, I'm happy to take questions or I'll be sticking around after in the chat to also maybe take questions as well. So would it be better to have the pelvis rolled under, not arched? I see a flat back maybe. However, I train my athletes not to roll under. To roll under. Okay, so this is a really good question. I should have said this in lecture. We do not want to see that really hollow tucked under pelvis position, right? So we don't want to see that because what happens is that you roll the pelvis under more. The chest is typically more upright and it puts a lot of stress on the knee, right? If you look at the research on proper squatting and proper deadlifting and proper like kind of hip hinging mechanics, you want to see a neutral uh, pelvis position with a slight arch. So what we call a natural arch. So just a very natural arch. We don't want to see mega, mega overextended. There was a study that came out in um, elite gymnasts in, in, the, in uh, I think, Great Britain, maybe, that they tended to land with a really overarched posture. So if you're really, really overarched, it puts a lot of stress on your back and you can't use your hamstrings and your glutes really, really well. Vice versa, we don't want to see somebody on the opposite, which is really tucked under, which if you look back in like Technique Magazine in the 90s, like that was being taught a lot of places. And we see a lot of people still struggling with gymnasts who all they know is hollow and they can only, you know, stay in that position. Position, they land in a very hips tucked under position and it's a ton of stress on your back. That's a lot of stress on the, on the discs of your back, but also it puts a lot more stress on the knee because you're more upright that way. So yeah, we would want to see that's the parallel kind of line thing is a slight neutral arch with a braced core and then moving through that nice squat pattern into a, into a squat depth. So uh, thank you for asking that, Sarah. That's a very, very good question that I should have touched on. Thank you. 